Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Joanna Williams. I'm an associate professor in the Curry School of Education. Um, I'm in the Department of Leadership Foundations and Policy and affiliated with a few different programs and a couple of different centers, including uh, the new Center for the Study of Race and Public Ed Education in the South, who is co-sponsoring today's talk uh, with VEST. So I'm glad to see all of you here, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Um, our speaker is Amanda Lewis. She's a professor of African American Studies and Sociology and the director of the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her research focuses on how race shapes educational opportunities and how our ideas about race get negotiated in everyday life. She is the author of, this is one of her books, Race in the Schoolyard, Negotiating the Color Line in Classrooms and Communities. <clears throat> She's also the co-editor of The Changing Terrain of Race and Ethnicity and co-author of Challenging Racism in Higher Education, Promoting Justice. Her latest book, which I also happen to have, and is one of my favorite books, I will say, uh, that I highly recommend, um, is called Despite the Best Intentions, Why Racial Inequality Persists in Good Schools. Her research has appeared in a number of academic venues, including Sociological Theory, American Education, Educational Research Journal, American Behavioral Scientist, Race and Society, the Du Bois Review, and Anthropology and Education Quarterly. She lectures and consults regularly on issues of educational equity and contemporary forms of racism. Um, she requested that the introduction I give be brief, but I felt like I'm not gonna make it too much longer. Um, I did wanna provide some context by reading a, very, uh, a couple of sentences from her book that I think really contextualizes the deep way in which she um, and her co-author engage with race um, in the study of this particular school. Um, if you have time to chat with Amanda after this, I would encourage you to ask her about um, what to get a PhD in her field and become a scholar of race who studies education. Um, it's also actually another place to find out in case you can't talk with her, it's at the beginning of this book. So she talks about some of her early experiences as a pre-service teacher um, at the beginning of Race in the Schoolyard. Anyhow, so <clears throat> in Despite the Best Intentions, she and John Diamond write, our racial history is part of our present. It is in our structures, its legacies can be felt in the way schools are organized, in how neighborhoods are laid out, in the composition of our family trees, in the unconscious stereotypes that get primed when we mentally sort people along racial lines. <clears throat> we walk around with it, and while it is never the only dynamic in the room, it matters. For example, the long history of degrading black and brown bodies and black and brown minds, of characterizing black and brown people as less than, as dangerous, or just deviant, is in the room when a teacher perceives a black student's questions as combative or threatening and a white student's as inquisitive. Clearly, no individual's or student's life and experiences are solely determined by their racial categorization, but the history and present realities of race shape the parameters within which we operate. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Amanda Lewis. That was lovely, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, so I'm gonna be talking, sort of trying to bridge a couple different things today, some new work that I'm doing and some things I'm grappling with, particularly in my role as the director of this research institute in Chicago, and then talking about um, particularly one chapter in um, the book Joanna just mentioned, um, and hopefully you'll see why, about how I'm bridging those different things. But one of the big, Kind of over there's a couple overarching questions that um, this book grapples with, and that I'm still grappling with um, and thinking about, and that I hope we can have more conversation with at the end. Um, the fun part of this for me is the is the conversation we're going to have, so we're going to have plenty of time for that. Um, and that is really thinking about, um, and this is true in schools, it's also true in other contexts. How many of the racial patterns we see in the world around us? Um, are, are very similar to the racial patterns we've been seeing for a long time. But the mechanisms that produce those patterns are different today. And trying to understand what the new mechanisms are, what the new forms are, how we end up with, in the case today, in the school I'm talking about, how we end up with very racially stratified academic hierarchies, tracking within schools, um, 
it, the, how that comes about is very different than it did maybe 40, 50 years ago, but beginning to think about how to change that um, requires understanding how it looks different today. Um, and for us, grappling both in this book and for me and my other work, a big piece of that is trying to understand how race works. And I, and I literally mean how race works structurally and also how race works symbolically. Um, and I want to provide a couple examples of how I'm trying to grapple with that now, and then we'll get into this work and then come back. So one of them is, um, I'll just give you two data points of, of things I'm struggling with. So one of them is looking at um, kind of the unfolding of kind of neoliberal school policies in a city like Chicago today, where there are, um, just as an example, we were talking about this a little bit at breakfast today, the city, the city public schools, which are controlled for the most part by the mayor who appoints the uh, school board, and we could talk about all that, um, they've opened up 100 new charter schools in, in the last few years, and at the same time started to shut down a whole number of neighborhood schools, particularly neighborhood schools on the south side of Chicago, which have um, predominantly black, because they're underutilized. So both opening up new schools and communities and then shutting down neighborhoods all with, as part of a kind of general pattern of um, disinvestment in those communities and trying to challenge the teachers union. There's lots of different things going on in that. But it's also part of a whole movement to, to try to recruit and retain um, white families back to the city and back into the public school system. Um, when the city first began really desegregating schools, um, sincerely for the first time in the early 70s. It stimulated what happened in a lot of cities, which was a major era of white flight, where the school district went from being about half white to now being about 9% white. Um, but still, when we look within the city at the schools that get the largest investments, new buildings, a whole, on a whole bunch of degrees, it is those schools that have 40 or 50% white students where most of the investment is going on. And there's a lot of conversation in the city about how to understand what what's what the district's trying to do um, and so I'll, I'll come back to that it's going to come back to a question of parents um, another m moment that this comes up for me and I promise hopefully all this will make sense eventually um, was there's a district right near Chicago um, called Oak Park and it's a district that um, in some ways is similar it's not Riverview it's similar to Riverview in a lot of ways that I'll talk about in a minute but it's a district that has gotten a lot of attention over the years because it's a district and a, and a city that has um, very much invested in staying integrated. So um, it's a city where they actually have the Oak Park Regional Housing Center that tries to ensure that when new people come into the city that they move into communities, that there's, um, it's predominantly black and white, some Latino, but that people are actually not just in the city as a whole, but block to block matched. And it is a place that a lot of people move because the schools are good and because they're diverse. Um, recently, some parents uh, FOIA'd, uh, Freedom of Information Act FOIA'd the gifted and talented data for the um, elementary and middle schools in the city. Um, and um, I was going to show you the actual table, but we end up talking about it for an hour, so I'm not going to show you the data. But the, the ba basic pattern is those schools have, on average, anywhere from 70 to 80 students in their gifted and talented programs, and about, on average, two of them in each of those schools are African American, even though the schools are about 40% black. And for me, that data point, which is sort of similar to the data I'm going to show you from Riverview in a minute, is a social fact awaiting explanation. And trying to understand how race works to both produce that pattern and to make such a pattern intelligible. So both produce that kind of pattern structurally and organizationally and make such a pattern seem like the normal operation of things. That that, that pattern had existed in this school district for a long time and, and seemed reasonable to people is to me entirely about how race works symbolically, right? How, how it helps us make sense of why, why such a thing might be, why we have the, sort of the most advantaged space, educational space in a community that's almost entirely white in 2018 and continue to function as if all is okay. So for me, this is in part, and these are the other sort of things I wanna sort of push us in, is about this moment in which I find troubling in discussions about schools and in schools themselves, a kind of absence of a commitment to everyone. 
so thinking about where is our commitment to a kind of a deeper public, where's our deeper public commitment to a collective good, um, and what does it mean when we're sort of all being transformed into consumers, in which the educational marketplace, this is where, this, where the title of this talk came, becomes the thing that we think is going to lead us all into the promised land and is going to be a solution to things. And in particular, what does it mean um, when parents are put in this role of having to be um, consumers um, as parents um, and um, are supposed to somehow, my, I guess the big question is, are parents going to be good partners when we think about questions of educational equity? Um, and you probably already know where I'm going with this. But um, it's a real question. Um, okay, so let's talk. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, one of the chapters from this book. I know some of you might have had a chance to read it ahead of time. It was, I think the thing I sent to Leslie. Um, and it's the chapter where we sort of ask this question about the role of parents and thinking about questions of educational equity. Um, and the, just talk a little bit about the big questions from this project. Um, one of the things that we were really thinking about going in was that there was, you know, big national conversations. People talk a lot about achievement gap, racial achievement gaps. And the question is, um, for us, what is racial about racial achievement gaps? Why does students' blackness, whiteness, Asianness, Latinoness have anything to do with their achievement at all? And trying to kind of re-look at that question in a whole new way. So um, there's lots of data that you can look at where race becomes a variable and it helps predict us things, but the question is really fundamentally for us why. If, if there's nothing genetic or biological about race, there's nothing, there's nothing different. This is a social category, it's a political category. Why should it, it predict outcomes? And again, as I said, why does it still predict outcomes today in 2015, 2016, 2017? Um, and in particular, how do racial gaps persist even in places where everybody has good intentions? Most schools, they're very, very you know, probably you could find more too, but very few educators go to school and think, man, I'm really going to get the these kids today. I'm really going to mess with them. I'm going to undermine their education. I'm going to, right? So that's not why people go, especially in schools where they're often underpaid and underappreciated. Um, and so, and here we really looked at to try to dig into these um, questions, a district that I'll talk about more in a minute, but that we might think of as a kind of best case scenario or what economists might refer to as kind of least likely scenario, a place where there's lots of resources, um, a real commitment to diversity, a lot of, um, you know, very liberal parents who move to this district precisely because it's diverse. Like I said, it sounds a lot like Oak Park, even though it is not Oak Park. I'll say that five more times. Um, and for us, also becomes a way to think about what we can learn from schools about these kind of racial dynamics more generally. About the thing I talked about earlier about how do we still how do we see very old racial patterns still um, going on today. And what are the mechanisms and processes that produce racial inequality long decades after we supposedly had all the triumphs of the civil rights movement? Um, okay, so in that way, we understand some of what we're seeing in Riverview and places like that as being, or perhaps capturing something larger about how race works more generally, which is always a question I'm interested in. Um, so, um, this is just to give you a brief sense about the district. We actually got invited into Riverview by a longtime administrator in the district who was about to retire and who said, look, I'm about to retire. We've been talking about minority student achievement forever. We aren't having much traction. Can you come please and study us and give us an answer? <laughs> if only it were that simple, right? Um, and in fact, when you, when you first invited us in, he said, will you talk to low achieving black kids? Will you come in and talk to the low achieving black kids and tell us not exactly what's wrong with them, but what's wrong or what's, you know, why they're not being successful. And we said, we're happy to come, but, um, you know, we're, we're going to talk to everybody. You know, we're going to talk to those kids, we're going to talk to their parents, we're going to talk to high achieving black kids and their parents, we're going to talk to white kids, the few Latino kids in the school, to, you know, it was obviously, as you'll hear, that we didn't think the problem started or ended with the low achieving, quote, unquote, black kids. Um, Riverview is an amazing place in lots of ways. I mean, I could show you even data from the school today. It's all very similar. It's a very successful school. They have high graduation rates. Um, there's lots of different, this is a story about success. People move to this district because dude, the schools are so good. Um, and in fact, has a per pupil spending rate twice as high as the city that it's nearby. Um, there's a real community commitment to funding the schools. 
And um, there also is a long history of racial gaps and lots of different kinds of school outcomes. So African American students at this school still do better than they do at the underfunded urban district that's nearby, but they don't do as well as their white peers in the, in the district. This is just one example from ACT scores. This is something that I'll talk a lot more about. If you look, I mean, this is one of, for me, one of the most um, uh, gripping parts of the of kind of thinking about questions like this, which is that if you actually walk into classes, so if you're walking through the hallway of the school, there's lots of kids. There's black kids, white kids, tall, she had short, everybody's together, and you're walking through the hallway, and it's that all that adolescent energy and smells and everything else. <laughs> but then if you walk into classrooms, they're not in the same classes. And it's a very, um, and again, um, if we think about it, the most advantaged educational spaces in the school are predominantly white. And the question is, how does that become part of the normal operation of things? Um, so again, if anybody has questions, I can talk about any of this. We were there for on and off for almost three years. We interviewed uh, almost 175, well, formally interviewed over 175 members of the community, lots more informal interviews and conversations, um, lots of informal observations. Data from this and um, 14 other districts like it um, that we look at some in the book, but um, so happy to talk about any of the research process, but I wanna actually get to the, to the meat of things today. Um, so I'm gonna get, skip over some really big pieces of our overall argument that describe kind of the daily practices and institutional structures. Part of the book is about how the school itself produces the gaps that it says it wants to get rid of. We found highly racialized discipline patterns and racially stratified academic hierarchies, as I talked about, um, and I'm happy to talk about all that more in the Q&A. But one of the things that we were impressed by and puzzled by in some ways um, at the school was that many of those that we spoke to, particularly those who work at the school, um, and particularly many of those people who are seemingly in charge, um, not only had really good intentions, but had some good analysis about what the problems in the school were. They sort of, it wasn't, like, in the end, if we told them what was wrong, it wasn't like they didn't already know some of that. Um, and they knew tracking contributed to disparate outcomes. They knew that they had real problems in the kind of patterns of disciplinary outcomes. They knew there was unfairness in some of that. And so a big question for us came, became why so little change? Um, and this was connected to another agenda of ours Charles Payne wrote this brilliant book a long time ago. I think it was published in 87. If you haven't read it, you should go read it. It's called um, Getting What We Ask For. And some of it's ethnographic, but there's this chapter at the beginning um, where he talks a lot about the need to focus not just on the have-nots, but also on the haves, and to kind of constantly remember that those things are always produced together, right? Um, it's something that we, we just talking about this at dinner last night, you could talk a lot about disadvantage, we're talking about advantage, right? So how do these things, how do these things get co-produced at the same moment? So rather than asking about what's wrong with the black kids or Latino kids or what's wrong with those low achievers, for us, a real big question was, what's going on with the white families in the school? What's going on with the white kids in the school? How do they understand what's going on? What role do they play? And what we found, and what I'm gonna be describing in detail in a moment, was a complicated set of competing ideas and interests this quote from a philosopher, Sandra Bartke, in some ways captures the interest. Um, white parents, I'm gonna sort of give away the whole story now, were key actors in the school who were also operating with good intentions. Um, but as we know from decades of survey research, um, commitments to abstract principles don't always translate into support for related policies. Um, and Riverview parents, you know, in some ways are really, I mean, what's troubling about this example, what's instructive about the example is these are not parents who moved to the all white suburbs nearby. There are lots of options. There's lots of other options for places to, for people to live. Um, and those aren't these parents. But in the end, um, we understand them to be racial actors who play a key role in perpetuating a set of structures and practices that benefit their children to the detriment of others. Um, and that's where we get into this conversation that I'll talk about later about opportunity hoarding. So when we interviewed these families, we wanted to know how they experienced the high school, what do they think of the school, why are they there, et cetera. And so that's what we'll kind of walk through. Um, and you'll notice a lot of times I'm gonna put quotes up here and I'm not gonna read them. You can read them or not read them, as the case may be. Okay, so this is an example of what we heard consistently. It's very rare that when you interview, like I think in this case, you know, 
20, 25 white parents that you're going to hear similar things in all of them. But one of the things we heard consistently from everybody is that they had moved to Riverview for its diversity and particularly for the diversity of the schools. And this is a great example. Um, they're clearly very good schools, but there are other good schools nearby. So this mother talks about, we, oh, they almost bought a house in another suburb, but we're like, ugh, we can't do it. She said, it's just too white bread, all wealthy, no exposure, everybody's privileged and too entitled. And you know they, they love they moved to the they love the diversity in the schools and this we heard over and over and over again. Okay, so that's fact one. I'm just going to put some things next to each other for a minute. The another thing we heard a lot was um, many white parents talked about their kids automatically getting tracked into honors and AP classes. It was just kind of how it happened. They got to the school, they got put in those classes, um, and for them, it, you know, it made sense as one of the fathers I talked to said, he said, I'd been in honors, and so it made sense that they would be in honors. Um, and this was true of a lot of interviews. It wasn't always the case, though. There were cases where kids were put in honors for only some of their classes or weren't printed in the honors at all. And what we found was for that, those parents, um, they um, worked very hard to get their kids reassigned into honors classes. Um, and they said things like, you know, even though he didn't have the test scores to be in honors, he made it clear to his counselor he didn't want to be in the regular classes. Um, they put him in biology regular. That was the only, that was the one I fought. Um, her feeling was that his reading scores are high enough. And I said, I've been here before. You know, there's just a lot of talk about strategic intervention they made with the school to make sure their kids were in honors classes. And I, I, there's one exception to this that I want to talk about later. I can talk about the one guy who didn't do this and, and what his explanation was, but this was pretty consistent. Okay, why did they all put their, push their kids into honors? Because they know the honors classes are better. And we heard this over and over and over again. It shouldn't be a surprise to those of us who know anything about the national research on tracking. Part of the reason why tracking tracks are so uh, powerful and why tracking has this negative consequences for stratification is because higher track classes tend to have better teachers, they tend to get more, I mean one of the principals talked about the honors and AP classes as getting bell to bell teaching, right? Teaching starts immediately when the bell rings, it goes till the end, till the next bell rings, whereas he said a lot of regular classes, you know, there's some social time at the beginning and maybe ends three minutes early, right? So the kind of structure and functioning of the classes is different and parents know this. Um, you know, it's an excellent high school, especially for kids who are in the honors program. What they say is that the teaching quality is not as good amongst the teachers who don't teach honors. I think that as an honors student, the school certainly is set up to benefit her. I don't really feel like I could talk to what the resources are in other parts. Um, the system works well for kids on, on top of things, all of those things. Um, and, and some parents said, you know, I told my kid they could stay at Riverview as long as they were in honors and otherwise they were going to have to go to private school. Um, okay. So they know that this is an educationally um, advantaged space. Um, and the kids even talk about it. So the kids talk about the different kinds of teaching that goes on in different classes. This is, um, we also found some evidence of what Sean Kelly has called teacher tracking in which teachers are tracked into different levels based on experience and that sort of thing. So this is clearly um, an educationally advantaged space in lots of different ways. The other thing that parents knew is that there were, um, that these were segregated classes to some extent. They regularly talked about that their kids in these classes, um, I just ran out of space, I could put more quotes up here. Um, you know, because we wondered, did they know, right? So here are all these parents who want their kids to go to Riverview because it's a diverse school and they're pushing their kids into honors AP classes. And the question is, did they know that by doing this, they also meant their kids were primarily gonna be in, in, in white spaces most of the time. Um, and the answer that we discovered in context of talking to these um, families was that yes, um, that they knew that these um, classes were predominantly um, white. They also, so one of, one of, I don't know, if you haven't read Carolyn Tyson's book, you should go read it, uh, Integration Interrupted, I think it's called. Um, it's a great book, but one of the things she writes about is that one of the consequences in schools like this where there are racialized um, tracks is that there's negative consequences for um, stereotyping and stuff, right? So there's lots of consequences for kids. It, it tends to tighten rather than loosen the association of, of race and achievement, race and intelligence. It, it, um, it's a kind of structural manifestation of, of the kinds of, again, some symbolic ideas about race that permeate. Um, and 
we had these long and interesting conversations with parents where they actually talked about um, knowing that this was happening um, for their kids. Um, you know, this woman um, is talking here about the way that her kids began to kind of stereotype kids more, about kind of blanket, making blanket statements, as she says, about African American kids fooling around and not being interested in education. Um, and she says, you know, I don't think, I, you know, I don't know, because race, you know, this, this, if you, you know, she starts to get very inarticulate along here, um, you know, the way they see it. But, and we said, do you intervene when they say stuff like that, when they make these kind of blanket statements that she says? And she says, yeah, but, you know, I don't think I'm, you know, making an impression because their experience is different than what I'm telling them, right? Um, or another parent who says, do they talk about racial dynamics? Yes, they will tell you that they know they have mistakenly walked into a regular's class. It's all black. I'm sorry, mom, it's all black. What do they think about that? They'll say they think it's a shame. <laughs> They'll also tell you, especially, you know, that um, they're sorry, but it's hard to take classes with them. It's not because of the color of skin. It's because of their level of ability to perform. They hold you back. The questions are stupid. Um, and she says, um, you know, I say, well, that's a heavily loaded judgment call. Um, but yes, they're pretty upfront about it, right? So it's sort of even being aware that the very motivation that they had for sending their kids to schools like this are in some ways being un um, undermined by these kinds of structures in the school. Um, and one of the other things um, that then started to become clear is these stories from personnel about um, these parents when we talked to school personnel about racial dynamics at the school, they talked a lot about the role parents play in these kind of course placements. Um, and um, as one of the teachers said, um, that these parents are constantly working the system to get what they want from the school. Mr. Morris, one of the counselors, said um, trying to do anything about the achievement gap was going to be met with opposition from white parents because, as he put it, folk who are benefiting from the gap really don't want the attention to be put on the gap because they want their kids to have the perfect education. These parents start planning and optimizing for kids in second grade like it's war, preparing for battle. Um, and the personnel narrated sort of exactly what we heard from parents themselves, that addressing these kinds of structural inequalities was going to be hard in part because of the pressure they felt from middle class white parents not to change anything about the current system as it was in place because um, their kids were benefiting from it. Um, and there were lots of different ways that these administrators narrated, um, narrated uh, resisting change. Um, this quote is sort of similar to what we heard from some other teachers that were partly concerned about um, one of the teachers, in fact, said something like, you know, when I first got here and I looked at the distribution of grades, I thought I must be wrong because there are all these kids in my class that seem okay, but they're not stellar, but they're all getting, she, you know, trying to understand the distribution of class ranking and even that sort of thing when you actually experience kids was puzzling to them. But anyway, so there's lots of different ways that, that people narrated um, white families or particularly upper middle class and middle class white families um, resisting change. Um, so this is what, uh, something that one of the mothers said. She said, what would I change? There are people who would change the leveling system. I would not. Um, I would probably try to figure out a way to make the boundaries. Le well, I don't know what I'm trying to say there. I know there are parents who, who are great proponents of just no leveling. She means no tracking. But I don't want my kids to sit in a class of 30 and have it be a waste of their time. I've been there. Uh, I don't know what I would change, to be honest. It's a pretty good institution, but my children are all at the honors level. Um, one of the administrators we spoke to said there had been an effort the year before to just begin talking about how to raise standards for the regular level classes, just kind of increase standards overall. And she said they, she had to take 150 phone calls within a couple of weeks of trying to do this, um, of people who were worried that this was going to somehow dumb down their kids' experience or impact, you know, kind of managing people's anxieties around what it would mean. Um, this is another, she says, I think it's an excellent high school, especially for kids in honors and AP classes with our daughter who's now entering in the fall after a debate about our center. We told her, if you can get honors, um, go, otherwise you're out of review. So there were lots of threats about exiting, various forms of what some, even the teachers we talked to talk about white flight. Um, threats to leave the district, threats internally. One of the things that the district had tried to do, which was to detract the sophomore um, social studies classes. 
They created these multi-level classes. They tried to organize them around the subject area, hoping that they would get students at least all in the same classes, um, and that students would sign up for whatever class seemed the most interesting to them. Um, and he said even when they did that, it led to what they, he calls, and what other teachers call white flight into certain classes within this structure, right? Of parents sort of undermining the, the school's attempt to do anything about this. Um, this is another um, conversation with a different administrator who says at one point, I attended over 200 meetings with parents of kids to talk about the standards and the fact that we needed common standards and not different standards and to reassure parents um, that what she calls our high-end kids that this is not dumbing down um, the curriculum. Um, and this was something that they felt like they constantly had to reassure parents um, of kids in the high track classes was that any change that they tried to make would not impact their kids, which is of course ridiculous, right? Um, any change there, if you're really gonna change the structure, it's gonna impact everybody, but this was something that they felt like they had to constantly um, work on. Okay, so um, one might describe these white parents' general orientation um, and the kind of, so I, I'm, you know, we really struggle with trying to make sense of these kind of contradictory narratives that were going on, and they all go on with, within, the, within the space of one 90 minute or two hour long interview, where people send, articulate one set of values and then articulate a really different set of preferences, and trying to make sense of the contradictions of all this can be a um, uh, fun set of debates, you know. John and I spent too long writing this book, and in some ways, um, one of the things that was actually useful about all that time was really time to kind of sit on and try to make sense of some of these things that didn't seem to make any sense. Um, so one might describe part of what we landed on, trying to make sense of these white parents' orientation to schools, um, is this concept of racial apathy. Um, it comes out of the work of, of Tyrone Foreman. Um, and he calls racial apathy a modern form of prejudice um, rather than an active or explicit dislike of racial minorities, it says racial apathy refers to a lack of feeling or indifference towards societal racial and ethnic inequality and a lack of engagement with race-related social issues. At Riverview, racial apathy includes not only a general disengagement from the racial inequalities at the school, but a lack of any sense of responsibility to do anything about them. Um, and it also includes what he refers to as a process of delegitimization. Um, where certain groups are categorized into negative social categories so as to exclude them from being socially acceptable. Meaning in many ways that the, the Riverview parents we talked to expressed some sympathy about what they perceived to be the hardships that some black families faced. Um, in the most generous reading, they believed those hardships meant that black families had less energy or less time or less resources for their kids' education. And that as a consequence, black children were behind educationally. So this was their explanation for why there weren't um, more black students in these classes. In their less generous reading, they also believed that these parents and children maybe weren't as invested in schooling in general, or didn't value it quite as much. Um, in either case, they believed that achievement gaps at the school weren't a school problem because they arrived from different family practices something they believed um, the schools and themselves could not be expected to be held accountable for. Um, and they felt little responsibility themselves for thinking about how racial inequalities played out in their kids' school. Um, and for them, in fact, the one or two students that were in every AP class, one or two black students in every class, were evidence that blacks who wanted to could achieve at high levels. Um, and you can see lots of this in different quotes from these parents about, um, um, you know, needing to look at the home life, um, you can't look at the school to do everything. A lot of African Americans, you know, perhaps due to economic, there's a lot of talk about ec maybe economic factors. The thing about Riverview, though, is it has an actually pretty large middle class black population. Um, there's certainly a large stable working class population in the district, but not high poverty rates at all by any means. Um, and so while a few white parents suggested that teachers' expectations might play a role in students' achievement levels, um, there were no structural institutional explanations um, that they provided. There was an implicit and sometimes explicit contrast drawn between students and families at the bottom and those at the top. Um, and they, they talked a lot about moral, cultural, and social economic, socioeconomic boundaries in trying to avoid often using any kinds of racial language in explaining these things. 
Um, by not using racial language but employing arguments that attach sort of cultural meanings to race and class categories, people continue to justify racial privilege and reinforce racial stratification um, and, and justify their own privilege positions um, while simultaneously accounting for what they perceive to be the failings of others. Um, and actually lots of folks doing research on middle class kids have talked about this as an sort of important skill that kids learn to cultivate over time, learning to explain their, other, their own success. Um, anyway, so there's lots of evidence at the school um, that while parts of the hierarchies are institutionalized and invisible, there are other parts that are visible and that are actively constructed and defended. And to understand this, we can't, for us, it's part of sort of similar to the quote that Joanna read at the beginning, we can't disconnect the present from either the larger social context or from the larger historical context. So understanding these racially stratified academic hierarchies, that's a phrase from some of Carlo O'Connor's work, um, forces us to think differently about what we're seeing, understanding that there has never been a moment at Riverview when these hierarchies weren't, when these tracks weren't racialized, right? There's, there's never, there was never a point at which everything was equal and then it sort of became less equal, right? This is a common thread throughout the history of this school, this history of this long-term desegregated school, but understanding how we make sense of it today, um, it's a, in some ways another version of the same thing that has been true for quite a long time with perhaps a different set of legitimizing narratives. And the part of that historical thread we zero in on here is the role that white actors play and have always played in reproducing their own racial advantage. So we might have thought differently about what it meant to, to go to, a, if we talked about the 1930s, we might talk about white schools as having far more resources and understand what was going on there in Virginia or Georgia or any place, right, of thinking about of these de, um, de jure fact segregated schools. But in many ways, in cities like Riverview, in cities like Chicago today, white educational experiences remain different. And the question is, why is that the case? Um, and there's a lot, a variety of mechanisms starting early in their lives that put many white folks on average on different educational trajectories, reflecting neither inherent talent nor cultural values. The skills gaps that can result are often represented as being an outcome of collective deficiencies rather than differential opportunities. As philosopher Elizabeth Anderson puts it, ideologies of inherent group difference misrepresent the effects of group inequality as its cause. So the resulting segregation at schools like Riverview have a multiple other consequences. Not only are higher track classes better, thus increasing already existing skills gaps, but the consequences for intergroup relations and perceptions are not good, as we already know. Um, we know a lot from work on race relations that bringing racial groups together can, can reduce prejudice when those have groups have equal status, but when they don't, um, such contact does quite the opposite. Um, while clearly not a monolith, white parents are racial actors whose actions work cumulatively to protect the advantages their kids receive from the way the school is currently organized. Their behavior may only barely be obviously or explicitly racial in any way um, that we might have thought about in terms of historically aggressive opposition to busing and that sort of thing. Um, but whites are still participating in the racial hierarchy and working to ensure their children's privileged status within it. And this is what gets us to thinking about that behavior as a kind of opportunity hoarding. And here we're building on work by Pamela Walters, Nancy T. Tommaso, and others who are sort of talking about what it means to advocate for one's own group, to do organized, deliberate activity um, that may not have anything to do with trying to hold anybody else back, but that has to do with um, pushing for um, one's own. So now it's done more subtly, and perhaps in seeming less organized fashion, but white families in review, they weren't getting together and organizing to keep students of color out of honors, but really they don't have to. Um, the historical pattern persists with different mechanisms. White middle class parents are not just advocating for their own children, but they're also advocating for the maintenance of structures of inequality um, that their kids are benefiting from. This resembles a lot of what Pamela Walters found in her study of white responses to broad school policy movements. She shows that whites basically worked to delay, dilute, or stop policies that they perceived would undermine their competitive edge. 
um, just uh, drawing a parallel to the gifted thing I mentioned earlier when um, the superintendent at Oak Park um, said, okay, we've got this problem on gifted, we need to rethink perhaps how we do this, and I'm, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you later on how they actually place students in the gifted, it's kind of remarkable. But um, there were, she has these monthly coffees that usually she would get maybe four or five parents from. She had 100 parents showing up every time. You can't, you know, no, you better not be changing gifted. This is important, our kids are special, they need all this special stuff. Um, okay. I'm going to try to wrap up here, and so I have plenty of time for conversation. I promised I would take only 40 minutes. I'm going over that a little bit, but I, I am concluding here. Um, okay. So one of the things that I want to talk about is this thumb right here. So white parents in their various roles as advocates for their children or activists in the community or on school boards are in many ways just protecting the system as it is. We aren't arguing that racial antipathy or racism and any kind of um, narrow definition, you know, not, they're, not, they're not trying to operate, they're not operating with any active dislike of black people. They like black people, they want to be near black people, right? Um, but we, as I said, argue with a certain kind of racial apathy. They certainly are comfortable with a certain level of inequality um, in their kids' schools um, and in their own exp um, daily operating. Um, collectively, their efforts to help maintain a status quo that benefits their kids more than others, we think deserves some attention, um, and theoretically and, and practically. So as I said, on the surface, white middle class parents seem nonsensical. How could they want diverse schools, but not really care if their kids don't actually have diverse friendship networks? How could these liberal parents who choose to live in this community, in part because of the high quality segregated schools, be so untroubled by the structures that reproduce segregation? Um, but in fact, their response to these kinds of things was to just try to protect their kids' experiences and protect their, um, the structures. Um, so one response to this that I've gotten, that we've gotten a lot over the years, John and I, about when we talk about this, is that this kind of opportunity hoarding, um, it's not fair to criticize these parents for doing this kinds of things. Um, because essentially what we're doing is criticizing parents for loving their children deeply and for ad advocating for them strongly, right? It's only natural for parents to love their kids and to want the best for them, okay? Um, the problem is that such logic implies somehow that other parents don't love their children as much or just need to advocate better. Uh, in fact, the problem is not the extent of parental love, but the gaps in material, cultural, social, and symbolic resources that enables them to translate their care and love into more advantages for their kids. And these resource differences interact with school policies and practices that, in fact, enable white and middle class parents' resources to pay off. Um, under current arrangements, this working the system to maximize opportunities for their individual kids will inevitably contribute to stratifying processes that have decidedly unmeritocratic effects. The answer then is not for all parents to do what these white parents do. The whole point is, not that, is that not everybody can. As Mr. Morris, who I talked about earlier, implied, responding to the regular demands of some families leaves little time to address the needs of others. There are only so many hours in the workday, only so many spots in high track classes, and only so many award-winning teachers to go around. Another part of this, and this is more of a theoretical conversation, is that what some of my colleagues, um, Joyce Bell and Doug Hartman, wrote an article about this uh, a couple of years ago, um, which is that there is a kind of new discourse that we're all operating with. It's sort of an update or a sort of different version of what some folks have talked about as kind of colorblind racism. But there's that this new diversity discourse in which people, almost everybody, wants diversity, advocates for it, think it's, thinks it's a good idea. Um, and as they write about, sometimes, sort of similar to these parents that I'm talking about, um, they, these actual commitments to diversity can seem very shallow. Um, parents define their desire for diversity narrowly. While they want to see their kids to have diverse experiences, they're not willing to sacrifice any advantage to ensure such experiences are actual, real, and substantial. And while we might think of those contradictions as being um, uh, illogical, they argue that, in fact, these contradictions are quite functional. 
um, that the tensions and ambiguities between people's optimistic discussions of their ideal selves and their actual limited commitments to practicing diversity should be understood less as cracks and fissures, as they put it, and more as the source of the discourse's real power. They argue that diversity of course is a kind of happy talk that allows Americans to engage race on the surface but disavow and disguise its deeper structural roots and consequences. That is to embrace diversity, to feel support for it, to feel as if they're living out their ideals, welcoming, supporting, engaging differences that exist in a multicultural metropolis, even as they are largely avoiding dealing with the complicated racial reality of which they are a part. Um, and this kind of diversity helps to reassure review white middle class families that they're living up to their liberal commitments. Um, combined with larger ideologies of meritocracy, it helps them to understand that while there might be an uncomfortable pattern of inequality in their children's schools, these are not um, patterns for which they have any responsibility. Um, so while we might say Riverview parents have chosen to embrace racial and ethnic diversity rather than avoid it, Theirs, as we put it, is a very loose embrace, a kind of um, embrace of the idea of diversity combined with perhaps only a limp handshake to the reality of it. Um, which gets me back to where I started, um, which is to think about, as John Dewey talks about here, um, where we, how we get back to a commit to everybody. Um, and what it means, not just at Riverview, but in the designing of school reform models and urban schools um, in general, what does it mean that um, our commitment to a larger public has been um, undermined in lots of ways? David Labrie has written about this a bunch, about what it means for us all to be turned into consumers in the context of education. He says, educational consumers, students, and their parents quickly learn that the greatest rewards of the system go to those who attain its highest levels, measured by years of schooling or track or institutional prestige, where credentials are the most scarce and thus the most valuable, right? So partly the scarcity of the resources are the things that make them valuable. This vertically skewed incentive structure strongly encourages consumers to game the system by seeking to accumulate the largest number of tokens of attainment in the most prestigious programs at the most selective schools However, nothing in this reward structure encourages learning, since the payoff comes from the scarcity of the tokens and not the volume of knowledge accumulated in the process of acquiring them. This is all about a focus on exchange value, right, rather than use value. Um, and education as a private good becomes the thing that we value over education as a public good. Um, and there's, as I said, lots of evidence of how this manifests itself. And that once we, you know, part of, the, part of the challenge in all this is it really does turn parents into the arbiters of whether or not their kid is gonna have a quality education. So rather than thinking about the state, and I mean the state in large sense, not like the state of Illinois, but the state as being responsible for providing high quality education for all kids. We, um, so part of the, the other project that I'm, I'm just gonna stop talking a minute so I'll get into it, but I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A. We recently interviewed about 150 parents in Chicago about how they decided where to live and send their kids to school. And one of the things that we found is that some of the parents whose kids were in the, in the lowest quality schools felt themselves responsible for that reality. Um, because they knew that there's this school choice system, they don't really know how to access it, they don't really have full information, they don't know how it all works. But there's a sense for them that it's a, their failure as parents, it kind of privatizes the school failure. So rather than thinking about what it means that in this school district of 300 plus thousand children that half of the schools are, have the lowest rating in, the, in this very fuzzy rating system, right? So, so there are just not enough good options for all kids. But that becomes a fault of the parent rather than a fault of the districts, which is another kind of side of this same coin about what it means to, um, and for me, one of the big questions, and this question is something that, that particularly I've given a couple talks recently to mostly parents and school districts, and it's an uncomfortable question about whether parents really are gonna be good partners in thinking about educational equity. Um, whether we, you know, if it's true that really what we expect is for parents to relentlessly advocate only for their own kid, then it reinforces the idea that it's really on us as school policy thinkers, as school administrators, as teachers, to think about what our policies are gonna be. And one of the, one of the kind of, um, not uh, slightly facetious or slightly sarcastic examples we give 
around these kind of things is that we either need to say it's the school policy that those kids who have lots of social and cultural resources are gonna get the best education um, because we're gonna let them strategize and do all this stuff to get into these good classes or we need to, you know, so we should say that's our policy and that's what we do and then do it or we really need to change how we function. Um, very similarly with discipline, you either say that if your parents have a lot of money and threaten to hire a lawyer that you won't have to have consequences or you change the policy, right? So either, either of these need to, we, we, because this is what's going on is the practice in a lot of these school districts, right? So either we claim those practices as what we mean to be doing or we need to be functioning sort of differently because thinking about families as the driver of this may not be, um, anyway, but that's actually a big question for me and something I'm really interested in talking more about and I will stop talking now and take questions, conversations, comments. <laughs> One of the greatest reassurances for us, and it's something that helps because people often are trying to figure out where Riverview is, we gave a talk recently to about 30 superintendents that were part of this network of districts, and all of them thought we were talking about them. So at least at that point, we could say no. Um, um, and I will tell you as an asterisk, the super, Riverview has made a lot of changes. Um, we gave them all this data and information and they, they have actually, I could, I'm, I could get into the nuances of it and the details, but then you'd be able to figure out what district it is pretty easily. But the superintendent had people organized him to try to fire him at least five times over the last 10 years while they've been doing a lot of work. So it's been uh, bare. Yeah. So we've identified, you know, we've identified these attitudes and you talked about um, state the policy or yep. change the policy. Yep. What, what is the action? What should the policy be? How do we change those um, functions in the face of so much opposition from powerful people? Okay, so there's two different questions. So what's the right policy? I'll answer that. And then how to change is a totally different question, right? <laughs> so I... Having consumed, having, so I, my work isn't on tracking in a kind of it's narrow sense, but having read most of the research on tracking in schools for a long time, it's pretty educationally indefensible. Um, and uh, so I, I think one big thing is just detracking schools. Now it's hard to do, it requires attention to, it requires a lot of supports. Um, and often what you're dealing with high school level is tracking that's happened a lot earlier, so you actually do get skills gaps sometimes at the high school level that are a result of, so I'll just give you the inside scoop on this example in a park just because the data is public and so I feel like I get to talk about it a little bit. Um, and it's not my data, so I don't have to. So I was in this meeting with the superintendent and all these um, administrators and I said, well, how do you do this tracking that starts? Because it starts in second grade. In second grade, you kids get tracked. And I said, tell me a little bit how it works. And so they talked about this test that kids get at the end of first grade. And that in second grade, then kids get um, tracked so that if you get, depending on your scores on this test, you then skip over a year of math. The interesting thing is, there's a, this, so there's this highly verbal test that happens at the end of first grade. So most of us know that like one of the big gaps that come in, a lot of it's driven by social class and other things is they're large. So we're basically giving a test of verbal abilities at the end of first grade that might as well be a test about social class. And then we're using that to skip kids over a year of math, okay? Now there was a lot of silence in the room after she explained that, because that's weird, right? It's hard to explain that, defend that. But once you get skipped over a year of math, you're then on this path that takes you not only into this higher track math class, it's literally very hard after that point to get back on a track where you can be slated in time to take high school calculus. Like you, you know, you don't, you know, a lot of people know this, but you gotta take algebra by a certain time in order to take geometry by a certain time in order to take high school, you know. And all those things, so, um, I think there's a lot of reasons why that is just crazy, right? And there's a lot of data um, and evidence from lots of quantitative and other studies about how certain group kids get placed more likely or more likely to get placed in other types of classes and gifted classes than others, even despite test scores. All this. Um, we also know that the the effects of tracking is often just to make what are skills gaps much larger. I think the big question often that I talk to school administrators about is if we really believe that all kids can achieve a high levels and we really believe that kids all have the capacity to learn. I understand, right? 
aside with some learning differences and everything else, right? We can talk about that. Um, then we just need to organize schools differently. That, that's not, you know, and it is also the truth that if you read anything about the history of track day, it's completely indefensible. If you read about its deep connection to eugenics movements and to the very racist history of intelligence testing, it's, it's really, really then starts to get deeply uncomfortable and hard to defend because there is never a moment in which, oh, that was the old racist, I mean, explicitly racist, right? And class and stuff. So that was the old tracking system. But now we've got this new, I promised I wouldn't move around. I apologize. And then we've got this new tracking system that's totally different. No, it's the same one. It's been going on forever, right? It expanded after desegregation, right? Surprise, surprise. Um, so that would be one clear kind of policy. There's also lots of policies around discipline that we could talk about. Um, now, are they going to be hard to implement? No. I mean, the first thing I say to any superintendent or anybody I talk to about starting to think about this stuff is you have to have a whole plan for resistance. And in fact, I, I think that whoever you're going to put in charge of implementing your equity agenda has to be a different person than the person who's managing resistance. Because if the equity person needs to manage the resistance, that's all they're going to do. <laughs> Literally. Right? And that's one of, the, one of the ways it's successful. If you've got to go to 200 meetings to deal with you're just not going to get anything else done, right? And literally, that's partly what happens sometimes. You're just inundated. And so the equity agenda becomes this very slow moving um, or not moving train. So that would be, and we, could, we could talk about lots of others, but that would be one that's an, that's an obvious one and a really challenging one. Redistributing wealth would be another policy change. But I don't think that's going to go anywhere. Yeah. Stay close to the top. Yeah. Yeah. That's a class behavior. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's kind of blending hero class and race. Yep. I mean, these it's middle class parents behave that way no matter what. Even if they were in a school with other white kids who were less advantaged, they would still do the same thing. Yeah. They're like getting their kids retested and yeah. figure out ways to get them in high classes. And Absolutely. Teachers. So I wanted to kind of think about kind of. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, you know, what would happen with African American middle class parents? Yeah. Are, do they have opportunity for it? So kind of think yeah. of a class and race intersection. Yeah. And the other one is related, which is, you know, you mentioned uh, at the beginning that the, the kids who were, um, you know, African American, they weren't poor, but it sounded like there was a class difference. Um, and I'm thinking about LaRoe's work yep, suggests sure. that, you know, it's not that you need white people to be rich and, and African American to be poor, but you just need enough of a gradient. So one is middle class, one is working class, or one is upper middle class, that if there's a gradient of class, that this is exactly what you would expect. The yeah. only, you know, in some ways, you could extend her argument to say the only way to deal with this is to actually deal with class yeah. um, before you can even begin race. And so uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little about how, how much of a gradient is there really? Yeah. And is that something that has come up uh, in your conversations? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, uh, th lots of different Absolutely, class matters in this. Absolutely, and but it also matters in complicated ways because it's even if black and white parents are making the same income, they don't have the same wealth. You know, so class is different, right? So a lot of so if I could if I talked about some of the individual families in this, there were black middle and you know black parents with professional degrees, right? who still didn't have the resources that white families have, didn't have the long-term connections they had, didn't have, right, so um, didn't have the person on the school board, all those kind of things, right? So um, even when they were middle class, even when they're upper middle class, by certain measures, right, we could talk about, you know, all the different ways we can, right, measuring classes, it gets complicated, and we most often do it by occupation or education, but it doesn't, you know, wealth kind of drops out, and so the intergenerational stuff gets lost, right? Um, so that's a big piece of this. Um, and I think, you know, thinking about LaRoe's work, which I think is really useful in a lot of ways, I mean, one of the things that she shows that I think we would agree about is that, you know, is this fact that all parents want their kids to be successful, right? And so they're all trying. I mean, we talk a little bit in one of the earlier chapters about opportunity prying, about kind of the black parents trying to do some of this and it not, just not being as successful, partly because Teachers and school administrators wanted to say no to a lot of people, but just felt more able to say no to some than others, or more rigorous, you know, or just said no more than once, right? 
And so listening to how parents talked about whether they're, you know, I think, I think actually Annette Leroy and Aaron Horvat wrote a piece about this years ago, right? About like even trying to leverage or get involved, it gets responded to differently, right? I think the other challenge, and, and I feel this all the time as a highly educated, you know, um, by any measure, probably upper middle class, white lady, I'm a white lady, but I have a black child, and watching her go to school and navigating with parents, the thing I'm constantly confronting when I'm watching her navigate with teachers, and this is something that you hear from parents all the time, is all of the ways in which my class is not protected for her, right? So, you know, I go in, I'll just give you one example. Um, this is in first grade. I go in and the teacher says, you know, we're talking about math, and, and the teacher says, oh, she's doing okay, and we start looking at all the evaluations, and like, they're all 100% right. I'm not, she, my kid's not a genius, I'm not saying that, but like all the things that she's like, and we're like, well, what is she missing here? And then she was like, oh no, no, she's, she's doing pretty well, she's keeping up with the fast kids. I'm like, who are these fast kids? <laughs> and like, if she's running right next to them, how come she's not fast? I, it was like, you know, so there's this constant, and I just, that's just one of my, there's this constant process of just feeling like, gosh darn, sorry, I was gonna curse, but I'm not gonna, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, so, and parents, so parents talk about it all the time, right? Or like, uh, these parents in Oak Park, this district I was telling you about, half of my colleagues live in Oak Park, right? It's this, it's like where a lot of the faculty at UIC live, because it's so close to the university, and it's like, the first web suburb west of the city, and it's like the best school system, and blah, 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 blah. And I have a colleague who's a math professor, who's a math education professor, um, right? And his kid got, didn't get, you know, did not get tracked into this, you know what I mean? And he's just like, okay, what do you gotta do? You know what I mean? So I think there's, there's so there's clearly an interaction there, right? So it's, it's absolutely the case that middle-class black parents are trying to do some of this stuff. They're just not doing it as successfully, Right, so I'm not saying there, I mean, and, and what I started to say about, about LaRoe's work is I always think of her as having missed this one thing about constrained cultivation, right? So black middle class parents might be doing concerted cultivation, but even in her book, if you read the stories of those families doing it, they're constantly facing barriers at other people. And I think we also need to acknowledge that more explicitly because then it helps us understand how black middle class parents and families are, so of course, class matters. And that's part of the reason why we study Riverview is because it's a place, I mean, normally when we think about achievement gaps, it's like you're, you're dealing with the very stark patterns and resource differences that, that congeal among communities and that have all kinds of implications. Um, and Riverview is not a perfect example because there isn't, but I think that's those ways in which those things are interacting all the time. Yeah. What else? <laughs> Thoughts, reactions, yes? I find this to be like heavy. And, you know, I'm thinking about the solutions yeah. to this. Yeah. And I'm struck by nowhere in the stuff that families get from school is a message about the value of, like, the mental health value of being with kids who are different than you, mm -hmm. say, in high school. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not part of the conversation at school. I'm curious, have you ever seen schools working on these kind of problems who are conveying to white families the value of intergroup contact? That is a really good question and a really interesting uh, piece of this about whether schools are doing that, whether they might use that as a leverage point. Not necessarily. I mean, I certainly, I mean, part of what you get when you talk to people about diversity and the benefits of diversity is you do get people making a kind of human capital argument, right? It's gonna be good for your kid, they're gonna think better, they're gonna, it's a global, you know, we live in a global world and they need to know how to navigate certain, con certain contexts. But I haven't seen people necessarily be explicit about the idea that like, if you're in this diverse school but your kids aren't actually having contact, then it might actually have a, you know, it might, you know, actually getting into the research, right? So actually getting into what we know. I mean, if Tom Pettigrew were a better speaker, he should go out and give a million talks about this, right? He's done all the meta study. You know about intergroup contact. He's a, uh, um, he's an amazing, I don't know, if you ever have a chance to meet him, Tom Pettigrew is an amazing guy. He's like very grumpy and short and all the other, he's so smart. And so, 
you know, on it about these, anyway, it's sort of a joke, but, um, <laughs> but no, I haven't, now I will tell you, I have recently, and I think there are certain, there are certain, um, there aren't a lot, but there are certain gifts that one might pull out of 2016, <laughs> thinking about 20, the last year and a half, there are certain gifts. One of them has been, I think, that, um, that people, what, like, when I give talks, or in general, people aren't talking about us being at a post-race moment as much anymore, right? It used to be that whenever I give a talk, one of the first questions I would get would be like, but Obama, you know, <laughs> like, aren't we done with all this, right? And that's not the case anymore. And I also see lots of, I mean, you guys experienced it, I think, pretty viscerally and recently, right? People are aware that standing on the sidelines maybe isn't such a good position. You know what I mean? Or that it's not enough to just feel a certain way that like, so there's a lot, I think, so part of what I mean by that is in Oak Park, the parents who foia'd that data were white parents. So there's an interesting tension. There's a group of, of families in the district who certainly don't want things to change. And then there's a group of families in the district who are like, this is not okay anymore. It needs to change. And those are, there are a lot of white middle class parents in that group who are just like, we are gonna be on the equity train. We are gonna, we are gonna, I, I'm gonna keep going with this metaphor. We are gonna shovel the coal for the train. We're gonna do the hard work to make this happen. We're gonna put a lot of pressure on the district and we are gonna make sure that the resistance doesn't stop it, you know. So I think there's been interesting and new energy from communities I think that I hadn't seen as much in before and partly because of the kind of larger moment, racial political moment that we're in. So um, if there's a kind of hopeful part of this message or a hope, you know, I don't think it has to always be this, I mean I think there's I think there's other, I think people are beginning to think about what does it mean to have a kind of commitment that's bigger than, than within my household. Um, I, don't, I don't know that that's like gonna bowl things over anytime soon, but to me at least, it's a kind of hopeful set of signs. Yeah, yeah just to follow up with Michael, I'm wondering if you're uh, ever interested in doing any research with those families mm -hmm. that, um, you know, are actually mm -hmm. I'm teaching a class on structural determinants of inequality, and one of the things that we've been talking about a lot in that class is whether, like, the possibility for learning about how to undo, like, a lot of this damage is from what sometimes seem like more like an anomaly, right, than these instances where somebody is being an advocate or is essentially a white middle class yeah. family. Like, if that's the thing we want to generalize to other white middle class families, and you've shown us a lot of white middle class families who are not doing that. Yeah. So I guess I'm just interested in what you think about possibilities to learn from that, and then also if you just know of any examples. I saw this several years ago, and it might have been in Atlanta or somewhere in Georgia. A researcher, I think this was when I was at the University of Michigan, <coughs> talked to us about a, a superintendent who just got rid of tracking. Yeah. Like, just abolished it. And yeah, yeah. there was like, all, but, he, but just made like a unilateral decision and then dealt with the follow-up and said, you know, like, there's no way that this is gonna be a policy that we are gonna like modify in any kind of way and, and not uh, continue to reproduce these disparities, right? And so he just, he just uh, eliminated it. And I'm, I'm just curious about kind of thinking about those as possibilities for learning, you know, how, what this could look like and how to maybe then, you know, have more broad spread kind of change. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, most often when people talk about detracking, they're referencing Carol Burris's work, um, who, both detract a district and then got a lot in the road about it a lot. And she's got some great articles about kind of thinking about how to do that and about how to make change happen and, and that, um, that sort of thing. Um, and so, yes, I think absolutely. I'm, I wish I could. I wish I had the time. I wish, you know, I, I keep pointing students. I think there's some great dissertations to be written about, about that work going on. One of my students is writing a, Doing, studying a sort of dissertation, one of the kind of moments in Chicago that's sort of different than other things that are going on. I think we were talking about this a little last night. There's a, there's a school that is in the kind of wealthiest neighborhood in the city right by the Gold Coast, and it's one of the, it's one of the most, you know, 
one of the best, it's the best probably neighborhood school. <coughs> so one of the things Chicago has is the structure where they've created all these select enrollment schools or gifted schools where they, you test into them and you go to a separate school, um, which has got its own, we can talk about that. Um, but um, this school, um, Ogden, is a very, you know, uh, people move to the neighborhood, you know, or send their, and um, anyway, so it's been, over and roll forever, and they've been talking about building a new building, and they started talking about raising money to build a, a new building, because these are people who aren't gonna wait for the district to build one for them, they'll just raise the money themselves. And then the principal of the school is a very, very smart, very actually very progressive guy, um, uh, started meeting with the principal of the school that's less than a mile away, and what used to sort of shadow of what used to be Cabrini Green, one of the largest public housing structures in the city, and it's a school that accommodates up to 1,200 students but has 200 students in it currently. It didn't get closed because there was a moratorium on school closing after the last round was so controversial. But um, it's a school that's probably not long for this district, right? Um, and they said, let's merge schools. You have a building that's under-enrolled. I've got a building that's over-enrolled. We're less than a mile from each other. Let's just, you know, we'll be K through three. You'll be four through six or whatever, right? Well, you can imagine controversial, you know, and so lots of furor on the part of people at Ogden about what it meant. So Ogden is a school, so the district itself is 85% black and Latino and about 89% low income, right? And Ogden is 40 some percent white and, you know, in a district that's about 6% Asian, about 20% Asian and then black and Latino and the, I think the poverty level is like 30%. So it's like a very different school than the loss of the district. Although ironically, like one of the most diverse schools in the city. Um, and, uh, and Jenner is 99% black and 99% low income. Um, but there's only 200 students. 200 students out of 1,200 students. Um, anyway, but the people leading the push for the merger are white Ogden parents who think it's the right thing to do. And they are leading all the pushback against the parents who are going to meetings and saying all kinds of sometimes not even very veiled racist stuff about how this is gonna destroy their school if these 200 kids get added and you know. And so it's been a very, it's been three or four years in the making. The district is gonna issue a final decision in the next week or so about whether it's actually gonna happen. Um, but it looks like it's probably going to happen finally. I mean, the, the principal of Ogden was told to plan for it. Um, but it's, he is studying it and partly studying it for that very reason. I mean, what, is, what can we learn from this case about, about why these parents said, look, this is just the right thing to do and we should just make it happen? And um, you, can make, you can make lots of arguments about it being kind of low stakes in some ways. I mean, it's a really troubling that even this is so hard to make happen. Um, and honestly, if I were anybody who were, if, if I was gonna tell any group of parents to be worried in this whole situation, it would be the Jenner parents. Um, I think it's hard to know how well they'll be served in this newly merged school. Um, but yeah, so I think, I think there's lots to be learned. And I think it's really important to understand what motive, and I think there are people who kind of have studied white anti-racist activism. I mean, it's part of the work like Mark Warren's work, other people who, um, Jane Adams actually wrote about this a long time ago, but what are the kind of both cognitive and affective things that really seem to move people to act in ways that are, at least on the surface, seeming against their in interests, right, in some ways. Um, the other thing about the detracting thing, I, you know, one of the things that's just struck me recently dealing with a lot of school leaders is just like, um, I don't wanna say this in a really, well, okay, I'll just say it and then we can, I can backtrack from it, is, is, a, is courage, the need for more courage. So I think people often know what the right thing to do is. I'm not saying it's not easy though. I mean, people do lose their jobs, right? You will get fired. I mean, the district, you know, like if you push too hard and push too fast and do it without the right support, you will lose your job. The upside is superintendents are in high demand. It's not a very appealing job and there's lots of, you may have to move, you know, whatever. Uh, so I'm, I'm being facetious, but um, uh, it's high risk. It is high risk work, but it is hard sometimes to talk to people who are running schools and running districts where thousands of children, right, little kids, you know, are coming every day, and I know I'm running a district that is doing harm to some of them or not serving them. I mean, it's just hard sometimes to listen to people, adults. You know, we as adults fail kids way too often, um, and so that's hard to listen to sometimes. But you know, but I, I am empathetic. I mean, I, you know. You know, I have a job that would be hard for them to get rid of me, so I can say whatever I want, right? But, yeah. Um, so what I, I really like the question that they asked me about yeah. 
large habits going to be good allies in this fight for education. I yeah. think it's making the system a little mm -hmm. it's got more room for opportunity. Yeah. And we talked about kind of like some ways to kind of get them to understand what's at stake and, and getting them on your side of it. And then you also talked about how we need new school leaders who, in some circumstances, are on board with the idea, but that need the courage or need the kind of like support and protection, as you said. And I'm wondering your sense of where the teachers fall on this spectrum mm -hmm. of who mm -hmm. tend to be allies or tend to not be allies. And I think like the naive narratives of like, we, you know, we see a lot of sorting of our teachers according to class and race and ability. And so it's like, you know, you have the kind of like mm -hmm. old narrative old drama teachers who teach AP classes for their entire career. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and at least in the school that I worked at, there was like a lot of, you know, the principal wanted to keep track of school. Like every single teacher in the school wanted to keep track. And, um, partially out of like a, you know, the narrative, like how hard is it to teach an untracked classroom? Yeah. And similar to what you were talking about before, like how hard is it to kind of completely overhaul the disciplinary system of like sending kids to the principal's office? Yeah. You know, so I guess, what is your sense of the, the landscape for teachers and how they seem to be moving on this new world now? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I don't think there's a single answer, a singular answer to that. I think it's sort of exactly what you were saying. I mean, which is that sometimes teachers are sources of resistance. So in the example about Oak Park where I told you before, the, the superintendent didn't make a public statement about gifted. What she did is say to a group of teachers who are the gifted teachers, we are gonna have to rethink how we do this. Those teachers went immediately and told all their parents, hey, hey, get your little ears up, something's about to happen. Um, and those, and that's how the parents found out about it and started showing up saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So um, it is absolutely the case that there are hierarchies for teachers, right? You know, like, and that it, I think, um, so one of the things like when, for Carol Burris and other people who've written about or talked about detracking is that it does require a certain amount of getting teachers on board. And hopefully starting with support of key teachers and then doing a lot of work. And so when I talked about Riverview and some of the work that they've done with detracking, he talked a lot about really, 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 really working with teachers a lot to get them to understand that they were gonna get the supports they need to do this well. And one of the things that he, they found is that eventually that teachers were really surprised that it wasn't harder, that in fact conversations in their class were better. I mean, all the things that we say are true and that people don't believe, right, that their conversations in class were better, that these kids that they worried were gonna be disruptive, once they actually got into a context where, where the teaching was more engaging and more interesting, like so once it was less, you know, surprise, surprise. I don't know how many of you have sat in an earth science class recently. There's some boring, boring, I mean, earth science should be so interesting. I'm just giving that example. I'm sure there's some wonderful earth science teachers. But a lot of what happens in, in high school classes is tedious and boring. So once kids got into classes where they were actually like in history classes, using primary sources or doing, they were super engaged, right? And so, um, but I think you're absolutely right. People are, I think in general, you know, people are nervous about change. I think sometimes unions can either be advocates, like the CTU has been an amazing kind of uh, source in the city because one of the things that they've been successful at, they've had a much more radical agenda than teachers unions typically have and they've partly done it by having a wide lens. But they still, there's a lot of tension within that maybe isn't always clear publicly because there are a lot of teachers who are just like, I don't want any of this stuff. All this stuff is just, you know. Um, so uh, I think you don't want to sleep on the fact that you need to get teachers on board. I think that's also the lesson here and I think that's a really important point to, to pay attention to. Um, I think, um, you know, I think all of us are also learning about you know, if we didn't remember already, you know, that all politics are local. I mean, one of the things going on in Chicago right now is trying to get people to run for local school board, not local school councils, not school board, which is n not an elected board right now. Um, but because it became clear as a lot of groups, like there's this group Chicagoans United for Equity, as people were trying to do some of this work, that school councils were this important lever that people had neglected. It's like, it's like people don't, you know, when somebody was running, you know, somebody who said she won with six votes, like that was how hard it was to get elected to the local school council. But they make all kinds of budgetary decisions and things. People have just been forgetting about it. So I think there are lots of ways in which um, I'm reminded more and more, and I have, I have friends and colleagues who like, 
are running for school board now, not in Chicago, but in other places, because they realize that like there's actually a possibility of having a local impact, even in a context, brought in a broader context in which it's hard to kind of stomach some of what we see politically now. Sort of an aside. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thanks.